He's going to talk about, I assume if you haven't changed the title, I have the organization of the dugout. Yeah, yeah I, I, I've got a subtitle there you can see uh, oh. that, that I did add, but the title's the same. So you got it. Um, <laughs> my subtitle is Why Are Baseball Contracts So Weird? Because uh, baseball contracts are a little odd. And the reason why they're a little odd, at least as an economist looking at baseball contracts, is they're especially unique compared to the other contracts going around. In the MLB, there's oftentimes guaranteed money, that is, whether or not you play, you end up getting paid, and there's no salary cap. Whereas in other places, in other sports like the NBA, there is a salary cap, or in the NFL, there's a salary cap, and guaranteed contracts are actually very abnormal. Uh, it's, it's irregular for that to happen. And so MLB contracts are oftentimes known as being some of the best contracts for uh, their players. Uh, whereas the NFL is kind of known as being, uh, you know, players maybe get a high reward, but they, they've got a very high risk. Uh, and so MLB contracts are often considered the gold standard. Only recently have they fallen below average pay uh, to the NBA. Uh, but the question is why? Why do we have these different contracts in baseball? And so there's a few common explanations. Uh, the first is the union argument, that the Major League Baseball Players Association uh, has a long history, and it's had several very good leaders, and these leaders have assured the players' well-being. So that's one explanation. I don't think that's wrong, but I do think that's an incomplete explanation. And so uh, the question you have to ask then is, well, why isn't it that the players' associations for the NFL and the NBA, by the way, both existed longer, why didn't they fight for the same? Um, you know, economics, one of the lessons that we learn is that if a union exists, it must be benefiting someone. It might be the members of the union, it might be politicians, it could be the business itself. Sometimes weird things like that happen. But the, for the union to exist, it must be considered beneficial by someone. And so there must be something that makes baseball unique, that it's able to have this union that can negotiate these good agreements that other sports don't have. For example, the NFL and the NBA. And so there has to be a reason why the union in, the, in Major League Baseball is able to uh, broker these good agreements. Here's another common explanation that you see in the literature, is that, well, players are willing to, to pay their team, in other words, they're willing to give up some pay in order to remove the risk associated with getting injured. And so, you know, I'll get a salary guarantee, and in exchange I'm going to be paid less. Uh, again, we run into problems, and there's a lot of problems with this explanation. In fact, enough that I would say it's probably a wrong explanation. Is that first, uh, why would this be true in baseball but not football? Are football players, you know, more risk preferring than baseball players? That seems like a weird assumption. Furthermore, uh, why aren't owners this risk averse? Why wouldn't owners say, eh, no, we're worried about paying you for doing nothing. We don't want to guarantee your contracts. And so you have to assume something different about different sports or the owners and the players in order for this explanation to be true. And then finally, the, the last piece of evidence, though it's not perfect, actually shows that players with longer contracts tend to make more money. And so this flies in the face of the idea that you'll take a pay cut in order to get a more guaranteed contract, because we see empirically the opposite is, is happening. And so this doesn't seem right either. And so uh, this is where we can bring in some of our economics literature about uh, property rights. And uh, to, just to give you a brief overview, is that in 1937 there was an economist, Ronald Coase, who asked a question that really changed economics. And so you'll hear about the invisible hands later, but one of the things that uh, econ economists have talked about is the invisible hands. That is, you know, resources will go uh, where you know, it's efficient for resources to go, and there are reasons behind that, but that was Adam Smith's idea, is that markets tend to be efficient. But what Coase pointed out is actually businesses don't organize themselves like markets. In other words, inside a business, there's not a market that organizes where resources go. It's chosen hierarchically. There's a manager assigning resources. And so why do firms use central planning to make decisions if markets are efficient? This is something no economist had thought about before, is why aren't firms coordinated by markets if the market itself is efficient? Well, the answer is markets aren't always efficient. There are circumstances where markets aren't efficient. And those circumstances, at least for our purposes here, we can talk about that if the cost of buying and selling on a marketplace, in other words, if the cost of using the marketplace is too high, these costs are often called transaction costs. If transaction costs are too high, it makes sense to use hierarchy instead of markets. That's what the conclusion that Coase basically came to. And so different contracts in a kind of an economics property rights tradition, different con contracts actually reflect the solution to different problems of transaction costs. And so there's a reason why contracts vary. And I'll give you a classic example. 
and farming. We can have a lot of different contracts in farming. The owner of a farm could do several things. They could have a traditional wage contract. They could hire someone to work on the farm and say, hey, come work for me, I'll pay you X dollars an hour, $10 an hour, $15 an hour. That's possible. Farmers can also offer, offer a rent contract or a commission contract where they say, you pay me to come work on my farm, 700 a month, 1,000 a month, 1,500 a month, and then you get to keep all of the crops that you earn and you can sell them. And so this is sort of the opposite. The owner still owns the land, but now the owner is getting paid and the worker is keeping you know, the residual. And finally, the, the solution that's considered the midway is sharecropping. And so, uh, you know, the farmer brings on a worker, he hires a worker, and they sort of split the yield. And so that's somewhere down the middle. These different contracts have different problems. And in farming, it tends to be that sharecropping, at least historically, rose to the top, and there's reasons for that. When you have a wage system, you have monitoring problems, especially when you have something like farming where there's random variations in weather that you can't predict. Did the weather this year, did the humidity this year really stink, or did my workers not work? This is hard for a farmer necessarily to measure. And so there's a problem that you might have shirking on your job site. On the other hand, if someone rents the lands from you, they have the ability to use your land opportunistically. In other words, you know, soil, you can get more out of your soil if you overdraw nutrients. The problem for the owner is if the, if the person farming there overdraws nutrients, they're ruining the owner's lands and they're getting to keep that extra because they're the residual claimant. And so in between these two explanations, and this was a puzzle for economists for a long time, in between these two explanations is the sharecropping explanation. Is that, well, there's not too much of an incentive to overdraw because you're not getting the full amount of crops, but there's also not as much incentive sh to shirk because your effort still determines how much you get at the end of the day. This is sort of a midway solution to these problems. And so let's go back to baseball, away from farming. And so this is where I think things get interesting, is that Farming, like we said, can't use wage contracts because it's hard to monitor effort. In fact, Alshin and Demsetz, uh, to economists in 1972, argue specifically that something called team production, which there's going to be an irony here in a second, leads to measurement problems because individual effort is hard to observe. You know, who puts in more effort when two people lift a box? This is hard to observe, so you have the ability to shirk. But actually, baseball is unique compared to other sports in that individual contributions are actually somewhat easier to measure. Not perfectly easier to measure, but somewhat easier to measure than other sports. And so, you know, uh, your team being bad could hurt your ability to get RBIs, right? You know, if, someone, if your whole team's thinking that day, you might not get a good RBI. Uh, but when you're at the plate, you know, that's all on you, and people can see that's all on you. You know, compare that to something like the NFL, something like football. How many incomplete passes is, are the quarterback's fault? How much is it the line's fault? Or how much is it the receiver for dropping the ball or not getting open? It's harder to tell when a quarterback is messing up if it's their fault than it is, you know, someone at bat or a pitcher, for instance. And so it's easier to monitor in baseball. And so because it's easier, more easily measurable, we should expect things to be further from commission contracts. We, we should expect them to be more like wage contracts. Remember, on the farm, if it were easy to monitor your worker's effort, then it would make sense to use a wage contract because the problem with the wage contracts is it's hard to measure. But on the other end, we also said that wage contracts make more sense when workers can opportunistically use the owner's property to enrich themselves. In other words, there has to be some problem that the owners don't want to do this uh, commission contract. So, you know, the farmer on the land could opportunistically use the soil. What's the parallel in baseball? And so uh, my, my subtitle here, Will Hurt for Pay, uh, is sort of my running theory right now, is that essentially, uh, and I think there's a decent amount of evidence for this, um, the, the larger sports economics literature confirms the finding that players' performance improves as they get closer to the contract deadline. In other words, players get better as they get closer to the end of their contract. Some economists say this is shirking. So at the beginning of your contract, you're kind of lazy. Towards the end of your contract, you work a, a lot harder. And that makes sense. That, that's a good explanation. Here's another explanation. Is that when baseball players are close to their contracts being up, they're willing to engage in riskier behavior to improve their performance. But they don't bear the full cost of the risky behavior because they stand to be loose by being injured, but so does the current team. And so in a way, the current team is subsidizing their risky behavior. And in economics, we say when things are subsidized, you get more of it. If the baseball player is injured, they still have their guaranteed contract. And so the player gets a benefit, uh, which is the probability of higher pay from their current team or some other team. And so if the player is engaging in riskier behavior, they're using property that's uh, ostensibly their owner, the, the baseball team owner's property, which is their talents, 
They're using that in an opportunistic way to solicit better job offers. Just like the farmhands overdrawing the nutrients, they're overdrawing a resource that contractually belongs to the owner, and in doing so, they're guaranteeing themselves better future outcomes. And so, you know, there, there's a little bit of evidence for this. Uh, and so the idea is that by utilizing these the three-year guaranteed contracts, they can, essentially teams can discourage players from engaging in this behavior. You don't have to be really risky if your contract isn't coming due. And so again, the, the point of a long-term guaranteed pro contract is to say to your players, you don't have to engage in that risky behavior the first two years. If contracts can't do every year, you put yourself on the line, you injure yourself every year in order to get a better contract. If you have three years, you're not going to take that risk. And so here's some good evidence for that, is that uh, Crown in 2002, they don't have this theory, but they, they found this evidence, which is very useful for my theory, uh, which is that both batters and pitchers spend significantly less time on the disabled list and have significantly above average batting time in the year prior to contract negotiations. And so before the contract's going to be negotiated, they're going to spend less time on the injured list. In other words, they're not taking as much time off when they get hurt right beforehand. And Lane also in 1982 showed that uh, you know, spending, time spent on the disabled list increased coincident with the pro prolifer prolifer yeah, sorry, proliferation of long-term contracts. And so again, what all of this is saying is that if you have a contract that's not coming up for three years, you can, you know, take time on the injured roster and not hurt yourself to do better. If you have a contract that's due now, then you're going to be more likely to hurt yourself because it can be measured. And so, uh, you know, we see more internal evidence of that, that among the oldest age group, pitchers are more likely to see a long-term deal than similarly aged batters. Again, pitchers seem to be more likely to get injured than batters. I think this is a pretty standard finding. And so they get more long-term deals because the owners don't want them to hurt themselves to get better contracts from other teams. Uh, so many see this as a form of shirking. It's a bug of long-term contracts in baseball. But I think my, my theory is that this is a feature that owners actually want players to spend more time on the injured roster, and so they give them the guaranteed contracts, because if they're hurting themselves to get a better deal somewhere else, that's bad for the owners. And so my theory is that everyone's gonna risk injury to get a better contract, by the way. Uh, this isn't like a, a binary thing. It's just that players will risk injury more often when they're at risk of losing something that doesn't fully belong to them, in this case, their baseball talent, because they can't just take it somewhere else if they're under contract. And so I actually think this is a very hopeful result for baseball as a sport. Uh, I, I think that baseball fans should look at this and be happy. And the reason is that because baseball players are uniquely measurable, um, they're able to uh, draw from their specific talents better. In other words, you know, in football, if it's hard for the quarterback's talent to be measured, uh, they might not be able to leverage that talent as much. But because it's easier to measure performance in baseball, uh, those, those players, both pitchers and, and batters, are able to uh, make themselves attractive, and this allows them to negotiate these better long-term contracts with no salary cap. And so you're gonna be able to continue to get this basically flow of talented players into baseball, because baseball is a sport where you can uniquely show off your contribution. And so uh, that's my, my theory. Uh, you know, I, I hope you all enjoy the paper. If you have any questions after everyone else is over, please let me know. So thank you.